So in your discussion board, I had you reflect on these pair of shoes, um, boots by, uh, painting by Vincent van Gogh, and this idea from the German philosopher Martin Heidegger that art kind of conceals a story and has a underlying story underneath it. And we can see in kind of the style that there is something about these peasant shoes that suggest a life of hard work. So we're gonna kind of go through some other paintings and different styles and see what stories they are trying to show us. So this is uh, Sarat. This is a Sunday on La Grande Jatte. <sighs> very different life that is being shown here. Um, it's a little bit of the pointillist, well, it is pointillism. If you zoom real close, you can see that every little detail isn't brushstroked on. It is pointed, just little dots everywhere. And you just see this leisurely life of kind of the upper class just hanging out at the beach on the side of the river. And I love that there's a monkey. Probably my favorite part of the painting. Um, you can go find this clip um, yourselves. But in Ferris Day, Bueller's Day Off, they go to the Art Institute of Chicago and Cameron back um, in the Red Wings jersey gets mesmerized by this painting and you can see why it's a beautifully done scene. This is what's called a triptych. It is three different panels. It would be covering usually an altar. Um, this is the Garden of Earthly Delights by Harmonious Bosch. <laughs> It's a weird futuristic painting. This is from the 1600s of what the world would look like if we just, as we give into everything. I mean, so we do have the scene, kind of the garden of good and evil, garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve are eating of the fruit in the corner and it progresses through debauchery and carnality into destruction. And I absolutely love the masterful detail, but there's a sense of disturbing and there's a sense of drawing in almost a futurism going in on it phenomenal. This is an early, early um, painting by uh, Giotto, um, the Italian painter, somewhere around three, 1300. This is uh, for St. Francis of Assisi receiving the stigmata. And you can tell with technique, you don't quite have dimensions and depth, though Giotto was one of the first painters to really try to get this depth. You can tell that the mountain and the trees are behind St. Francis, and then Jesus and the angel are back behind. And you have a clear depiction of Jesus, but kind of this angel also motif. The stigmata is the marks of, of Christ that he received during the crucifixion, and it's shown as a sign of holiness. St. Francis of Assisi, their story tells us, was a, in the three pictures below, was a monk who was concerned about all things nature and the care of nature and wanted to take care of the birds, consider the lilies in the f of the field and the birds of the air, as is in the gospel. <clears throat> you also have the kind of symbolization of holiness or a sainthood with the um, halo effect around the um, person. This is a 
going to be used for quite a while, but we'll see it drop out. This is the School of Athens by Raphael. Raphael is at the same time with the other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles of um, Donatello, who is more of a sculptor, and um, Michelangelo, painter and sculptor. But this is the School of Athens, and the Renaissance were Renaissance artists were obsessed with kind of bringing Greek culture back. They thought that the Greeks were the pinnacle of culture. And so they wanted everyone to have that, that feeling. And they tried to resurrect that. This is a mural. This is painted on a wall. Um, but you have Plato and Socrates in the middle. And um, you can kind of walk around, and if you walked around the painting, you have various other philosophers, um, Diogenes in the middle. Um, I believe Pythagoras is over here. But um, you have various other philosophers, mathematicians, to heighten the human knowledge. So instead of having the height of religiosity like the Giotto and the Bosch we have fully trust in human knowledge being highlighted in the Raphael. Ulrich Durer was a um, German artist mostly known for his wood sketches the four horsemen of the apocalypse but um I include the anatomical um, zoological sketches to show that in the 1300s or so when, um, sorry, 15, when Durer was active, that they understood kind of this realism and this rabbit looks as real as possible, but they were trying to understand the natural world. And there's a lot of artists who are trying to use their art to show nature and bring it to life. Um, Jean Van Eck, this is 1434. This is one of the more famous Van X. Um, what's amazing. So this is a wedding portrait. But what's amazing is that the mirror in the background, that's the detail. Not only do you have the signature above it on the wall that you can kind of make out, <coughs> but you also have the complete detail of the painting in reverse as if you were looking through the mirror. The understanding of optics and how light bounces off and back is immensely masterful in its technique. So this is one of the ones that's out there. This is 20th century, the great he goat, the witch's Sabbath by uh, Goya, a Spanish painter. Um, I just want you to take a second and think about this. Think about the emotions that you feel that you think the people would feel looking at this painting. How would you feel if you were part of this crowd? And that's going to be close to my uh, discussion, the, the reflection paper when we get there. Around 1500, 1600s, this is um, The Calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio. Caravaggio was a brilliant Italian painter, court painter. Um, son of a noble, wild man. Uh, he once killed someone because he lost in tennis with uh, against him. And um, because he had family connections, you know, nothing happened. But he had a devotion to religious art because at the time, this is how we could bring kind of moral stories and understandings to 
the people. So what's real interesting about this painting is the calling of St. Matthew by, by Jesus, the calling of the disciples. <coughs> Jesus is in the corner, in the shadow, where St. Matthew is the one pointing to himself. What you can, what really is interesting is that the garb is modern day for the time that this painting was painted garb to show that kind of this Christianity, this calling of Jesus transcends the time. And the whole story kind of transcends this understanding of being called out as a sinner and being called to a different life. This is kind of controversial painting. Um, this is the death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David. Now, if you look at it, there's a man who is dead in the bathtub holding a note. If you know the story, it's during the French Revolution, and he was a noted government sympathizer. He's both David and his close friend Marat. Marat is the one in the bathtub dead. Um, Marat signed the death orders for over 300 people to be executed by guillotine. In his hand in the painting is more orders for execution. Marat was a close friend and fellow revolutionary and painted this to stir up the emotions of the people opposing the revolution. And he painted this as a tribute because, and as a kind of damning of the the rebels, because you see Marat was executed, was killed, murdered in his bathtub. And he has a little bit of a serene face, like he's doing the right thing, like he's the martyr. And so it makes you kind of question a little bit what the right side was. But again, light and dark shadow play. You feel invited into the scene. It's got specks of blood and you understand that it's a murder, but it's not gory, it's not sensationalized. This is um, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Ram Rembrandt. Another biblical story, again, more contemporary garb, bringing the story into contemporary modern day for the, uh, for the audience trying to tell the moral story from the Christian scriptures of the son who runs away and comes back after squandering all of his wealth that he took prematurely from his father and the father still welcoming him back. You know, it needs to be restored, but you see the shadow work and you see the brother in the shadow And there's just a play of where you focus in on. This is just a fun painting. This is Manet painting, Monet painting in Monet's garden. So Monet is painting, painted this painting of Manet painting in Monet's garden. I hope you got that. But you just see kind of this style of impressionism. It just gives you the impression of what's going on. Nothing's in detail. Nothing has the fine lines. You can, kind of, you, you can make out Manet, but it's not like Marat and the David where you have the fine lines and you understand or even kind of the realistic of the face in Caravaggio, just kind of all washed 
together. This is Caspar David Friedrich, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog in the eight, from 1819. <coughs> this is an interesting painting and I want to get your thoughts on it. So I'm not gonna give too much, but it is of modern enlightened man conquering nature. But we still have this kind of contrast with um, a sense of blurriness, but we also have kind of the standing above nature of humanity. This is Guernica by Pablo, pa Pablo Picasso, 1900s, um, 1930s, um, Spanish painter. This is his depiction of the bombing of the city of Guernica during the Spanish Revolution. Again, this is one of those paintings you either love or you hate right away. You understand kind of the destruction though, the death, the fragmentation, where it kind of gives you this visual sense of the chaos before before you even know what it's about, different than if he painted a realistic painting of that bombing. This is from 1942. This is a hopper. Um, this is Nighthawks, very famous. Just this like ideal town, kind of city diner, corner diner couple on a date in the corner, a businessman sitting there. I wonder if he's lonely. That's something to think about. What's his state of mind? See, the, this is the idea of story. Is a painting like this, you can sit there and you can invent, make up a story. This one is Andrew Witt, um, Christina's World. Again, we're in the 1900s, um, 20th century. This always makes me feel sad and longing. Like she's so far away from home. I feel like she's trapped. I feel like she's hurt. But what it is, is that Christina is disabled and she has been able to make her way out and make her way back in unassisted, not needing the help of AIDS or um, any other conveyance. So this is a celebratory picture and I'm not sure if you get that or not by looking at it, which makes you wonder, do you need to know the story behind it to appreciate the painting? Because something like Rothko, Orange, Red, Yellow, 1961, makes me feel like I need to know something more than, about this. I, I need an artist statement telling me what this is about. He does not have one. It's oddly mesmerizing, but Rothko is one of those painters that you either hate or you absolutely love. And this is The Rabbit Hole by Jackson Pollock, yet again, still in the 20th century. <sighs> he invented the style of splatter paint. This is all just splatter spiral uh, from above a giant floor canvas. And I get a sense of being drawn and being drawn down. And I, I wonder if you get the sense of that you're going in or you're coming out of the rabbit's hole. You get the sense of the chaos of the various lines, but you also get the very clear understanding of where your focal point should be, where the eye goes, how the eye goes. And if you stare at it enough, you can almost see an eye with a pupil. Like there's just things there that draw you in. And for some people, this, this type of painting is terrifying. 
And for others, it's hopeful because they see themselves coming out of the rabbit hole. So for your reflection paper, what I want you to do is reflect on what story No, we're, we're going to mix that. How would this, choose one of these paintings, pretend it's on one of your walls in your house, your apartment, room, whatever. How does that affect your life? How does that affect your, your, your world? How does it affect your space? How does living with that story change how you interact with that space and with that? Does, does where the um, artwork change its meaning, change its understanding? Does it turn it from hopeful or sad or into something kind of opposite? Does the context matter? See you next time.